All right, we will get started this morning. We are in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Said to be by some uh, the most difficult chapter in the scriptures. So, been looking forward to this one. <laughs> Revelation chapter 11. There are multitudes of, of interpretations of different aspects of this text. It lends itself to multiple interpretations, and we'll look at the reason for that. But we're in an interlude, as we said. We have the seals opened, and then the trumpets sounding, and then the vials are going to be poured forth. So that's the progression leading to an unveiling of the judgment of God and the final things of this earth. We're in the midst of the trumpets right now. And there's an interlude between the sixth and seventh seal. And now we're in an interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets. We're actually in the sixth trumpet still, this interlude period that, that has been spoken of. Chapter 10, we looked at as being the witness of the church that in the midst of all of this, judgment of God, the church will yet have a witness. He says in chapter 10, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow upon his head, face like the sun, feet like pillars of fire. I identified that as the angel of the covenant of Christ. And as we said, some just ascribe it to a, a mighty angel of another kind. And he had in his hand a little book open. This is the open revelation of God. And he set his right foot upon the sea, his left foot upon the earth to show forth his sovereignty over all things. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, which is, um, there's some typology there from the Old Testament to the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices, uh, perhaps implying the next seven judgments or other things. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice say to me, seal up these things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. And he makes a vow, he swears, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and things therein and the sea and things therein that there should be time no longer. So he swears that this is the end and we're coming to the end of the uh, time of man as far as this opening up and revealing it within this book. And we saw that while some say it can't be Christ because he's swearing by God, we see that that has happened, that God does swear by himself because there's none greater to swear by. Book of Hebrews, also Genesis 22. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. That is, the final work of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be complete as he declared to his servants, the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel that stands on the sea and the earth. And I went to the angel and said, give me the little book. And he said, take it and eat it up and it shall make your belly bitter, but it'll be sweet in your mouth because that which is revealed to us from God in the scriptures is sweet to us, but it has bitter consequences as we preach it in the world. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, ate it up. It was in my mouth, sweet as honey. As soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said, you must prophesy. And so it is, again, the church, church's work is to proclaim 
the word of God. You must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So we see this consistently in the book of Revelation that the witness of the church of Jesus Christ, that as the world passes through all of its uh, problems and wars and rumors of wars, the church remains the same as far as its, its work. Its work is to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we come to chapter 11, which I said some of the commentators, number of them, said is one of the most difficult. And we'll look at it again, like we've been looking at the others, to try to understand the spiritual import of these things. He says, and there was given to me a reed like a rod, a measuring device, and the angel stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So the measuring is of the temple altar and the worshipers. But the court, which is without the temple, which seems to be an allusion to the court of the Gentiles, but the court that is without the temple, leave out and measure it not for it's given to the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot 42 months. So there's different views on this and some see the holy city there to be put as some sort of symbol of the church. Um, I have difficulty with that because when we get down to verse eight, it talks about the great city spiritually called Sodom and Egypt which are in which our Lord was crucified. So it's Jerusalem. We know verse eight is Jerusalem. The real city. It's not, not a picture. Um, the picture in verse 8 is that it's like Sodom in, in Egypt, but it's Jerusalem. So I, I am more inclined to maintain a, a, a literal view of who he's talking about with the holy city. But the court which is without the temple leave out, measure it not, it's given to the Gentiles, and the holy city, I would say, as Jerusalem shall they tread underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy. So we're introduced to two witnesses. Never told who these two witnesses are, just told that there are two witnesses. So this brings about all kinds of interpretations, whether the two represent all of the church or whether the two represent two specific ones who've been raised up by God, which I would be more inclined by the context to believe. It says they will prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of all the earth. So very typical of prophets, ministers of the gospel, they stand before the God of all the earth. In other words, they do their preaching in the presence of God and to be faithful to him. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So there is protection for these. From the context, we see that everybody hates them. The whole world hates them. The whole world wants them dead. So it's not surprising to find this mention of the special protection of God. Verse six, and these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Referring to two great prophets, Moses and Elijah, which is, which is raised up, of course, all kinds of suppositions about these two prophets, that it's Moses and Elijah returned, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand their connections that they're making, but what we, do under, what we actually do understand is that these two are given miraculous powers. So as we look at church history and, and the interpretation of this chapter all the way up till now, in every century, men have found incidents, circumstances, history within their own century to relate to and to say, this is what's happening in this chapter, okay? Just to be honest with you, every century 
has ascribed this to their own century. Because there's general principles there that are true in every century as far as preaching, persecution, protection of God. Um, the difficulty I have with trying to do that, first of all, because I see that being done, and obviously they're not all right, only one person can be right in that, so there's a lot of people wrong. But the difficulty I have is that I see in the text, if we take it literally, and I would take it literally, is that these men are given by God a kind of power that Elijah and Moses had as far as the plagues of Egypt and Elijah uh, so where it couldn't reign. And I don't see that. I don't see that in church history. I don't see that presently. Um, indeed, God, God, in the way that he's working with the church in bringing the Gentiles to himself, has not been working in this manner, okay? Which is why it gives me thoughts that, that, that yes, this is at the very end of the world and that God is doing something, even as we saw in the first interlude. What did we see in the first interlude? We saw 144,000 witnesses raised up, right? And to me, they, they sure look like Jewish witnesses from the text itself. And we relate that back, go back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, where God is telling the Gentiles, God is telling the Jews that the Gentiles are going to be included within the congregation of the Lord. It'll be Jew and Gentiles. Um, and he tells, he tells the, the Gentiles not to become proud um, because it's all by the grace of God. So he says in, uh, let's pick it up in verse 18. Verse 18, he says, boast not against the branches, for if you boast, you bear not the root, the root's bearing you. In other words, don't boast against the Jews who are in a state of unbelief at this point, and you as Gentiles are coming in and seeing great fruit among the Gentiles. Thou wilt say the branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Yes, because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Don't be high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, talking about the Jewish church, take heed lest he also spare not you, because pride is always damned in the scriptures. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, that is, the Jews and their city would be destroyed, the temple would be leveled, and the new dispensation would come in of the church. But toward thee, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you'll be cut off as well. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, will be grafted in. God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, uh, a uh, cultivated olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? And again, this whole chapter in chapter 11 deals with the fact that the Jews as a whole had been cut off so that the gospel could go to the nations, but they were still considered the ones whom God originally dealt with, gave promises to, converted, gave the oracles of God to, all of these things. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own eyes, wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That's where, in my interpretation of this text, I think Paul is clearly telling us that there is a fullness of the Gentiles to be brought in. And once the fullness of the Gentiles to be brought in, that means something else is gonna happen in Israel among those people. The something else obviously is conversions 
And he says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And that, I believe, is talking about all the Israel of God, both Jews and Gentiles. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Um, verse 28, as concerning the gospel, talking about the Jews, they are enemies, because they were. They were the, one of the greatest enemies of the church in, those, in that century. For your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, because they were the chosen nation. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as you in time past have not believed God, and yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. And so there has always been ministries uh, of bringing the gospel to the Jews. For God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now, let me back up just to one other spot. I really didn't want to go through the whole chapter again, but I need to kind of. Um, back in verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, rather, through their fall of the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. If the fall of them, of the Jews, be the riches of the world. In other words, that the gospel can go to all the Gentiles. And the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? How much more their fullness? What would their fullness be? Okay. So anyways, within my own theology framework and structure, I see for the Jew at some point in the future, the fullness of the nations are in and God is going to do something special with the Jew. And that something special is conversions. Bring them to Christ and to receive the Messiah. So in the interlude between in, in the, the seals and the trumpets, we saw the 144,000. We have another interlude now, and in chapter 11, we have these prophets raised up, these two, these two men. And uh, it says that, yes, they, they would be protected in verse 6. And it says, and when they have finished their testimony... And again, the book of Revelation is a lot about this word testimony, marturia. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So we know that's Jerusalem. Their bodies will be in the streets of Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations will see their dead body three days and a half and will not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. They that dwell upon the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another because these two prophets tor tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So they are very happy that these two witnesses are dead. They are rejoicing over it. They hated their testimony. They hated they're like Jonah going into Nineveh and proclaiming the judgment of God. They repented. These have not. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquakes were slain, 7,000 men, and the remnant were afraid, and they gave glory to God. The second woe is past, the third woe is coming. So this has been related to Jerusalem, this has been related to the death of Christ and his ascension into heaven, this has been related to the Turks, uh, and this has been related to the Reformation period, this has been related to everything, okay? So... Just so you know, I'm not weighing in as far as going to give you specifics because I'm not there. I think we can draw from the, these, this whole scenario great encouragement for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as we feel in our own country the pressure of an evil government presently trying to push us completely toward communism and socialism and understand that communism is anti-God. That's what it is. The brothers uh, over in Sumi, um, Renato was, sent me a message, and we're just saying that the Russians have continued, 
have resumed bombing from the border. They can reach it from the border without coming across. And uh, there is imminent danger of them taking over the city. And it said the brethren are, are very much, their hearts are very much concerned about what it would be if the Russians take over, if they, you know, take possession of the city, which is a, is, is, is a real concern because Russia is an atheistic state. They have their Russian Orthodox Church, but it is completely a false church. The real church is all underground and is persecuted. So Ukraine, for whatever faults it has, and I'm sure it has plenty of faults, has at least at this point the ability to have church in the open, you know, among these fo these fellows that we that we know. So I think this chapter gives us encouragement as does the whole of the book of Revelation as to what the duty of the church is and God's superintending protection of the church. So back up to chapter 11, verse one, it says, there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood and said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now the word for temple here um, we know that this is a symbolic measuring. This is not a physical measuring because number one, he's talking about measuring people. Number two, he's saying to measure the temple and the altar. They already know the measurements of the temple and the altar. They don't need to measure that physically. Those were already a, a given. So, and because he includes the people, it's like when we say you're going to measure, measure up a situation, you're going to measure up. So something's being measured up, uh, whatever this symbol is. It respects the word for temple and we looked at this study when we studied the life of Judas Iscariot the word for temple here is the Greek word uh, neos or neon and it means it means primarily to dwell to dwell and it is it is talking about the sanctuary the sanctuary was within the temple there was an inner sanctuary where they had the golden candlesticks and they had the bread, showbread, and they had the veil and then the Holy of Holies within that sanctuary. And so this particular word is talking about that part of the temple, the part that is the sanctuary. And we saw with Judas that when Judas went back to cast the coins that were hot in his hand now because he betrayed the Lord with it, and it says he cast them into the temple, it says in the English translation, actually he went into the temple and he cast them into the sanctuary itself, where the Holy of Holies was, a kind of attempted um, paying for his sins. Atonement is what Judas was trying to do. So, because this word, the way it's used, uh, like in the story of Zacharias, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was burnt incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Well, you burned incense in the naos, you burned incense in the sanctuary is where you burned it. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he was so long in the temple, in burning incense, where they were waiting outside for him to come out of that place uh, and to bless the people. And Jesus, whenever he would talk about himself, he did not speak of his temple in the broad definition of the temple, but always of the sanctuary. It would be the naos when he would say, destroy this temple, this naos, and I'll raise it up in three days. It was the sanctuary of God. It was the dwelling of God because that's what the word naos primarily means. It means to dwell. So it's the emphasis of that, where, that place in the temple where God dwelt because it was that which contained the Holy of Holies. And in a practical application of this study of this word, when God wants to talk about Christians as being the temple of God, he uses this word. When he says, you're the temple of God, he doesn't use the broad word, hero. He uses the word naos to say, you are God's sanctuary. You are where God dwells, which is why he then he says, do you not know that you're the temple of God? The spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defiles the temple of God, him God will destroy for the temple of God is holy. So the argument being that when God says your body is the temple of God, it's not just in some general sense, but it's in the sense that 
of the indwelling of God. So that whatever you do to your body, and, I, and we are good um, Stoics at times, and uh, I'm trying to think of the name of that other false group that believed the body was the body was nothing and the spirit was everything. And so we can be like them at times, thinking, what does it matter to God what I do with my body? You know, so long as I tell him I love him and that kind of thing. But actually, he says that in regeneration, he comes to dwell within us, and we are his, the temple, the sanctuary of God, and there's an actual indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, to defile our bodies is to defile the sanctuary where God is dwelling, and that God took vengeance on that. So it's, it's, it gives us a strong reason to obey the admonitions of Romans chapter 6, when Paul says to offer up the members of our body as instruments of righteousness to God, and no longer use the instruments of our body our hands, our feet, our mouth, whatever it is, as instruments of sin and wickedness. When God talks about the church, the building fitly framed together grows as a holy temple, a holy sanctuary again, because the church is made up of all these individuals. And in Revelation, we read together in chapter 3, 12, he that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. Um, Revelation 7.15 says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his sanctuary, though it's translated temple. But it's important. I think, I think it's good to make the difference in those Greek words. Probably our translations would have done better to make a difference to help us understand that and know that. So in chapter 11, the first two verses, it talks about it. It says, There has given me a reed like a rod. The angel stood and rise and measure the temple or the sanctuary of God and the altar and those that worship therein. But the court that is without the temple, that's without the sanctuary, leave it out and measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles, and the holy city will be tread underfoot for 42 months. So we know this much from the text itself, is that he's describing a time in which the, uh, the holy city, in which Jerusalem is being trampled, by the Gentiles, which this is, there's plenty of times in history in which, again, this is, could describe why you have different, uh, different ideas. But who, what is this measuring? What is this measuring of the sanctuary? Because it's, it's the sanctuary, it's the altar, uh, which would be the altar of incense, and those that worship. Now, most commentators would apply this to the, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're taking a measurement of who is the true church, who's the true church and who's not. And does this describe, you know, in my thinking, trying to connect the dots here with these two prophets and the fact that they're gonna be dead in the streets of Jerusalem, does this describe a time in the future in which God raises up two prophets to preach to the world after he's had his 144,000 martyred in which he has two prophets that he raises up in the world as a final witness against this wicked world who kill these prophets and then they're taken to heaven. And is he describing here taking measure of the elect of those that are left in the world at this point, but that the court was not to be measured because the Gentiles were treading it down. Is it the end of the Gentiles? It is, is it the fullness of the Gentiles having come in? We know that the book of Revelation has to be talking about the fullness of the Gentiles at some point because this is the end of time. And Romans 11 says there's going to be a fullness brought in. And it seems to indicate that once the fullness is brought in, something happens with, with Israel. So could this be talking about a time in which the fullness of the Gentiles has come in there's a complete disregard of the nations now for the Christianity. And God has raised up some of the, has converted some of the Jewish nation to be a witness at the very end for his name's sake, including these two prophets. And is, is that what this measuring is about? We certainly know it's, it's a measurement of, of some sort of the elect, of some sort of the remnant of God. Albert Barnes writes, 
rise and measure the temple of God, that is, ascertain its true dimensions with the reed in your hand. Of course, this could not be understood of a literal temple, whether standing or not, because the exact measurement was sufficiently well known. The word must be used of something which the temple would denote or represent, and this would properly be the church, considered as the abode of God, the sanctuary, on the earth. Under the old dispensation, the temple at Jerusalem was the abode. Under the new dispensation, that peculiar residence was the church, and God is represented as dwelling in it. Thus, the world is undoubtedly, the word is undoubtedly used here, and the simple meaning is that he who is thus addressed is directed to take an accurate estimate of the true church of God as accurate as if he were to apply a measuring reed to ascertain the dimensions of the temple at Jerusalem. If the direction be understood figuratively as, apply, as applicable to the Christian church, the work to be done would be to obtain an exact estimate or measurement of what the true church was as distinguished from other bodies of men and as constituted and appointed by the direction of God. A measurement of the church that its true dimensions or character might be known. There would be a fulfillment of this if at that time referred to here, there should be an occasion from any cause to inquire what constituted a true church and distinguish it from other bodies. This is something that goes on throughout the history of the church. What is the true church? Taking a measurement of the church. Because the church gets infiltrated, you know, you get the Roman Catholic Church early on, and it's a false church. And here at the end of time, can we imagine if there, is, if there is a great apostasy at the end, which seems to indicate there will be in the scripture, how many false churches there will be compared to the true churches? And so to take this estimate would be something that has to be done over and over again. And I think one of the ways they judge of the estimate of the church is whether or not it's a witnessing church still. Is it still witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it still maintaining that truth in a world that will not have it? And that seems to be the, the estimate that's given over and over within our text. And, and he refers, Barnes and some of the others refer it to, when he talks about measure the sanctuary of God, that is the dwelling of God, measure the altar of God. Remember, he talks about the altar of incense, prayers up to God, and measure the worshipers themselves. So are there worshipers? Are there worshipers yet? God says that he seeks those to worship him in spirit and in truth. We know that one of the true measurements of a worshiper of God or the true church is that they pray. And of course, the altar of incense, we've been seeing that. We've been seeing that mentioned in a very special way throughout the book of Revelation, that these are the true church prays, and those prayers are part of the means that God uses in, in accomplishing all of his purposes upon the earth. So do they pray? Do they pray? Because that's the very breath of a Christian, of a Christian. So Barnes says the obvious meaning is he should take correct estimate of their character, of what they professed, of the reality of their piety, lives, and the general state of the church, professing to worship the Lord. A careful examination into the opinions in the church on the subject of sacrifice or atonement, the whole question of the method of justification before God, what constitutes a true membership in the church. So... work through some of my, my guys here I have as I was working through them. So verse one, he gives me a read, tells him to measure this. In verse two, but the court, that's without the sanctuary, leave it out, ekbalo it is in the Greek, which is, has somewhat of force to it, to throw out, ek out and balo to throw. But the court without, throw that out, don't measure it, it's given to the Gentiles and the holy city will tread, be a tread underfoot for 42 months. Don't reckon it to be part of the true temple of 
worshipers. That needed to be thrown out. It indicates a time in which the nations are treading underfoot the true worshipers of God. The true worshipers of God. And there are indications in other parts of scriptures that there shall be at the end a great apostasy. The gospel shall have, shall have had success in the world and it, certainly it is having success in the world now. In every country, there's a gospel witness. Even in the most persecuted countries, there's a gospel witness. And uh, it seems to indicate that at the end, there shall be a great apostasy, a great hatred, a worldwide hatred, as it were, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and a joining together against the church. Verse three, and I will give power to my two witnesses. Again, why two? I don't know. We're not told why. We're not told who they are. We're just told this, that he gave, gives them power. He gives them power. And I think it's power to preach, and it also indicates the power of miracles. Because this is not the age of miracles that we're in right now. We are not in the age of miracles. The, the spiritual gifts that were in the apostolic church, we do not have the gift of healing, the gift of miracles like we saw with Elijah, like we saw with Moses, like we saw with the apostles, like we saw with Christ. This has not been that age. As the Gentiles are being called in, uh, it's, it's the power of the gospel unto salvation to the ends of the earth. And that power is being demonstrated throughout all the earth in the saving of souls. There seems to be indicated here at the end of time that God grants to two men um, power to prophesy and also some sort of miracles. Because it says, he gives power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy. And he gives an exact number of time that they will prophesy and that they'll do it in sackcloth, which means a time of mourning. It's a time in which indicates things are not well. Um, there, it's in Jerusalem, it seems to be where they're witnessing this and that things are not well because they're in sackcloth, they're mourning. Verse four, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of all the earth. So you have in some of the Old Testament prophetic books, the use of the olive tree as a symbol and the use of the candlesticks as well, the menorah. Um, and these are two olive trees and two candlesticks who are standing before the God of the earth as though these men have been raised up by God, they preach for the glory of God, they are in the presence of God in their preaching, they're protected by God, the text will tell us, um, <coughs> despite all of the opposition. Uh, we know that Christ sent his men in the New Testament out by twos, which may be just a very simple practical reason. Two olive trees is a much to use symbol in the Old Testament and it denotes, seems to denote in these prophetic passages, the grace of God, the grace of God. Sometimes it, and I think it's Zechariah or Zephaniah, I gotta, I'm not sure that I wrote it down. I was in it this week. Those two brothers I get mixed up. But there's the two, there's the olive tree that's connected to the, to the candle itself. And it's like it's continual grace being poured in in order to have a light because you would burn the olive oil. So but with the tree being connected to the candlestick, it was like continually the grace of God being poured in to the church to, to bear witness, to be a light to the world. So he seems to, to use that symbol here, uh, calling them two olive trees and two candlesticks because the olive tree itself would produce the oil and the candlestick would produce the light. And throughout the scripture, it consistently shows the olive oil or the oil, it's like the Holy Spirit pouring out his grace upon the church and then the candlesticks burning brightly, not because they have anything of themselves because by themselves, they can't burn a light at all but they have to have that oil in order to burn the light. So it's the Holy Spirit enabling the church to be a witness in the world. It's by the grace of God that we remain a witness in a darkened world. 
And this witness of the church is, and I'm not checking my time. Okay, I'm almost done. The witness of the church is divinely superintended and given the power to shut heaven. It says in verse 11, if any man will hurt them, and evidently there's a lot of men that want to hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So a lot of, again, a lot of discussion, is this literal or is he just talking about a superintending protection? I don't know, but I know he's being, they are being superintendently protected. That is taught within the text that they can preach this period of time only because of divine protection. <coughs> and they're in sackcloth, so they're probably in the midst of Sodom. They're in the midst of Egypt, because that's how they call the city in the text. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Like Elijah, these have power over waters to turn them to blood and smite the earth with all plagues, like Moses in Egypt, as often as they will. As often as they will. James, James writes concerning prayer. He says in James 5, 16, confess your faults to each other and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So James argues for prayer. James argues for the method of prayer, that this is the means God uses to accomplish his purposes. And these men are given power, the text says. They are given power. And it says in verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, when God is done, when God has kept them for the amount of time that he wants to keep them, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. So, and we'll have to look at that next time. This is the first mention of the beast, which, in, which we have a trinity that's going to be mentioned within our chapter of the beast, the false prophet, and Satan, an uh, un unholy trinity. And this seems to indicate the corrupt powers of world government will make war against these prophets and kill them. God will allow it. God has protected them. Now God allows them to be killed. And that's typical of the providences of God even now that we are protected uh, under every kind of circumstance until that time in which God says, it's time for you now to come to me. So that's, that we'll get, that's our start of this chapter and we'll begin looking We'll look at some of the passages on the beast so that we can get kind of a feel for the context of this use of the word within the rest of the book of Revelation since he's now first being introduced to us. But it's a very encouraging chapter in the sense of seeing that God's over, overriding providence and protection is on his church, even in the, very, in the most dark hour of the world. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would indeed... Uh, strengthen us by it, uh, strengthen our prayers, strengthen our witness, Lord, in this world for your glory. And we ask that you would help us and give us understanding. Be with Brother Micah as he goes to Georgia today and preaching at Brother uh, Britt's church there, Calvary. And pray your blessings upon the ministry there and upon the hearing ears there as well. Grant them uh, thy grace. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.